Welcome to the second installment of Swept Up, Discerning God's Spirit at Work in Your Life and a Local Church. The last time we got together, we talked about the history of God's Spirit, all the way from the beginning of the Old Testament, all the way to the end of the New Testament, and then all the way up through today, where we have so many different variations of different Christian tribes and how they think about the Holy Spirit. Um, today we're going to talk about how do I know what God's will is and what do I think God's spirits, his role is in, in helping me know what God's will is. We often struggle with questions like what relationships should I be in? Uh, what should I do after I finish with high school? Should I go to college? Should I go to work? Should I do something different? Should I go to the military? Uh, should I stay married? Should I buy this car? Which church should I be a part of? And when I get into a church, what level of commitment should I have there? And those are all great questions. And when you're in those moments, uh, when you're thinking about what God wants you to do, it's also a puzzling thing to know what his voice sounds like. How do you know when he's speaking to you versus having great feelings at the moment, maybe having gone to a worship service or a series of worship services where it was very positive and uplifting or, or guilt inducing and driving you toward a certain decision. But there's lots of different uh, variables that go into that. And uh, whether it's an emotional experience or maybe you've had a good night's sleep and, and good food the week before and you felt great when you went to that worship service and you felt God's call and then you get out into work on Monday morning and you're like, well, wait a minute, what, what did I hear there? And so we often struggle with what God's will for us is in our life and whether or not the Spirit is leading us in those processes. Um, there are times that we, we fail to recognize that we have a lot more choices than were available to the people in the first century uh, in terms of who we marry, what job we take, all those kinds of things. We're often predetermined for many people. Whereas today we have so many choices. We can change jobs, we can change relationships, you can get a divorce, you can do all sorts of things. And in our uh, pluralistic, progressive society, we often are overwhelmed with choice. And so we can be overwhelmed with the things that we take to God and, and wanting to hear from Him about. Uh, there are times that we can get into negative situations like why isn't God healing me? Why isn't I, why don't I have good health all the time? Or maybe why is it I don't have a better job? Why don't I get paid more money? God, are you hearing me? What's your will for my life? Should I just stay here and keep this dead end job? Or should I move on to this other job? At the other end of the spectrum, there are times that there are people who have a good life and maybe they had a good family growing up and they went off to college maybe even a Christian college and they've had good experiences and they have a good family now and they're part of a good church and, and they feel like because things are going relatively well, they must be in God's will. They must be listening to his spirit uh, from those big picture kinds of things all the way down to getting good parking in front of their favorite store, whether it's Target or Walmart or whatever. <clears throat> they can look back and say, well, I'm being favored by God. He's giving us, giving me his blessings because I'm obviously listening to his spirit and doing good things. Either end of that spectrum, either the negative side of it or the positive side of it, are things that um, aren't really in scripture. God is not currently in the new covenant blessing us when we do well and cursing us when we do wrong. Sure, there are natural consequences of the things that we do, depending on the culture we live in, but God doesn't um, put roadblocks up or open up doors based on whether or not we're listening to his spirit and doing the right things, as it were. At least there's no evidence for that in scripture anywhere. Over in the book of Acts, we can see that Paul the apostle and, and Peter and others uh, often would talk to God and the spirit of God would give them some hints, some answers, and sometimes they would say things like, it seemed good to the Spirit that we would say or do this. Uh, in uh, one instance, Paul had a dream where someone said, come over into Macedonia and help us. And he took that as a call from God's Spirit to go to Macedonia and share the good news of Jesus. At another time, uh, Paul felt like God had opened a door in another city, and it was going to be a great door to go through, and lots of people would hear about Jesus and respond to it. 
but Paul didn't go through the door. Paul felt like because of what he was going through, he was depressed because he wasn't in connection with one of his ministry friends, and so he didn't go through that door. So it's not always the case that there are blessings or curses based on knowing God's will for your life, listening to the Spirit and hearing what the Spirit has to say to you about any of those things. Over in Romans chapter 1, just a few scriptures here to walk through. Romans chapter 1, Paul says, I pray now at last by God's will that a door may be opened that I can come to you in Rome and see you and impart to you some spiritual gifts so that you can be strengthened. So even Paul prayed for God's will, that certain things would be his will, but it wasn't always the case that they turned out like that. We often pray for things. Lord, we want this thing to happen. We pray that it's your will, that you'll bless it, that you'll open the doors for us. And Paul did go to Rome, but it wasn't for the reasons that he wanted to go to Rome. It wasn't under the conditions that he wanted to go to Rome. He ended up going to Rome to be put into prison and eventually put to death by the Roman government. Uh, so there's not always this cut and dried um, way, this crystal clear evidence from God that this is the way things are supposed to be. A few years ago, um, way back when our two older kids were a little younger, um, we attempted to adopt a young man at Central Church. We met him through Camp Cottle, and uh, we were enamored with him, felt like he was a great kid to be around. We knew he was a special needs foster kid uh, that one of our members had been taken care of. And uh, we had gone through a failed open adoption some years earlier where we had to give the child back after six weeks of having her at home with us because the family had decided to make a decision to just end that whole process and just take her back home. So we were a little bit reluctant to step off into another process, but we prayed about it a lot. Lord, if it's your will, let us adopt this young man and let things go well. We pray that uh, this is what you want for us. And so we went through the process of having social workers come into our house, interview us, look at our house, check out our life, that whole nine yards. And eventually he was placed with us and the adoption process was more formalized at that point. And, um, but there was trouble. Um, he began to be violent with himself and with our kids both in public and in private. And um, month after month, when we met with his psychiatrist that the state gave for him to go see every month, um, we reported what was going on. And by the third or fourth month, I guess it was, the psychiatrist said, we really think it's best that you let him go back into the system. We appreciate what you guys are doing and trying to help people out and adopt this young man. But he's going to be a big person when he grows up here in just a few months and uh, he's gonna be bigger than your kids and he could be a, you know a danger to them and himself and we resisted that and said no this is what God's will is we, we really felt like this was the plan and then about the fifth month I guess it was he did some very uh, not so great things and uh, was trying to harm himself and others kicking out windows those kinds of things and so we finally came to the conclusion that maybe the psychiatrist, psychiatrist was right and we should give him back. So we made that call to DHS and they came and took him away from us. And um, it was very hard. Uh, he, kept, he would call us even though he wasn't supposed to. We'd talk to him briefly, but um, you know, we, were, we were grieved over the fact that we thought we had uh, listened to God's will and that he had confirmed that we should bring him home and be a part of our family. And so we did, and it didn't go well. It fell apart and we had to give him back. And so we were questioning whether or not we had listened to God's spirit and heard it correctly. Just shorten the story quite a bit. We, after weeks and months of grieving over that, um, came to the conclusion that it was a good thing that we brought him home and that we were a bridge from one situation to another uh, that let him have a, a respite, a place to be for a while, a family to be with. And then when we sent him back into the system, that he eventually did finally get adopted by a family that we saw in this large mass adoption event that was held down at the state capitol uh, a good while later, that we saw that he was being adopted by a family with a, 
a big country looking dad with overalls and, a, and they had a son who was about the same size as him. And so looking back, we felt like, oh, well, maybe that was good. Maybe we did hear the spirit right and that it was a good thing to bring him home for a time with us. But it was okay. It was okay that he went on and we lived life and we eventually had a third child of our own and uh, life was good. So looking back over that, we had a lot of questions like, what's it mean to, to listen to God's will? And, and I think that we found that there are times that we are looking for long-term answers where maybe it's a good thing to look at short-term things. That maybe it was God's will for us to, for a short time, have him in our home, but then release him on to something else. And that's probably one of the things we struggle with as Christians is we're looking for long-term things uh, based on our own cultural assumptions about how things should be. John chapter 3, Jesus told Nicodemus, the spirit moves about like the wind, doing what it wants to, place to place. We see its effect, but we don't know where it's going. We can't control that at all. And so it's important for us to simply trust and depend on God and just rest in that, have peace in that, and not worry that we're making a decision that's right or wrong, that's going to be pleasing or unpleasing to God. So some other scriptures uh, that kind of tell us a little bit about the Spirit and God's will. Uh, over in Romans chapter 8, Paul says, The Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. We don't know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. I wonder sometimes what we would say, what our reaction would be, if we were able to hear what the Spirit was saying to God on our behalf. Uh, there are times that the Spirit may be praying some things in accordance with God's will that we would say, I don't want to, I don't be praying that prayer on my behalf. That's not what I've been praying. So there are times that you know, we, what we would like to have happen, uh, what we would like to have the Spirit confirm for us, aren't confirmed for us, and we just can't know anything about it. This which is why Paul comes back and says in verse 28, we know that in all things, God's going to work things together for the good of those who love him or are called according to his purpose. And the good isn't necessarily good in terms of finances, family, relationships, health, those kinds of things. The good is that we are walking with him, that we are living in trust and dependence on him. Over in Romans chapter 12, probably one of the most powerful passages is about God's spirit and his will in our life. Paul says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. And then Paul goes on from there and describes what it would look like for a person at the, churches, at the church in Rome to live this kind of life, to be transformed by the renewing of their mind. And he describes people who have seen what God's done for them. In other words, in view of God's mercies, then they see how God has loved them and served them as a result of wanting to, to serve him and love him in response, it means that we go and we love and serve the people that are around us, regardless of their place in life, regardless of their status in life, that we love and serve people wherever we are, whenever we are, and whatever our status in life is. So it's not a matter of, Lord, should I take this job or that job? It's a matter of whichever job you end up in, that's where you're going to serve people and love them like God loved you. Over in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul says, uh, Nevertheless, each person should live as a believer in whatever situation the Lord has assigned them to, just as God has called them. This is the rule I lay down in all the churches. And later on in verse 24, he says, Brothers and sisters, each person as responsible to God should remain in the situation in which they were in when God called them. And a few verses later, he does talk about 
Now, if you're a slave, you can go ahead and get your freedom. That's fine. Go ahead and do that. Uh, but for the most part, don't spend your life wondering what should I do? How do I get out of the situation that I'm in and move to this other situation that I desire to be in? Paul said that's not a good motivation in life. And he was addressing concerns that they had about should they get married or not get married. He said, that's fine. if you want to get married, that's fine. If you need to, because of hormones and whatnot, get married. But if you can choose not to do so, don't do so. Uh, stay wherever you are in life and serve people and love them from wherever you are. So from the New Testament, we see basically there are very few times, if any, that God really just says, this is what I want you to do exactly. Uh, do this and you'll be blessed. Don't do this and you'll be cursed. Uh, that's just simply not the way he works things. Um, what he really act actually does, as it says in Galatians, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, and self-control. As we live our life and the fruit of the Spirit comes out of our life, there will be times when people want to know, why are you doing that? Why are you a loving person and patient and kind? whenever all the rest of us aren't when the world seems to be going to hell in a handbasket you seem like you still love people and we don't get that explain that to us and as peter says you know when it happens set apart christ as lord in your heart and be ready to give an answer for the hope that you have within you and the answer is not i got at this great church i go to which may be the case that's great but the hope that we have within us is that God loves us, that he lives in us, has given us all that we need for life and godliness, as he says in 2 Peter chapter 1. He's fully equipped us, fully blessed us, fully loving us and walking with us through all of life. And so that's essentially what the scriptures show us. So in the New Testament, God's will for churches or congregations or individuals or families uh, was simply to receive his inheritance, his blessing of forgiveness and grace. And in that process, whatever individual choices or group choices that are inspired by your passion, or your gifting, your opportunities, great. Pick one of those that makes sense to you and pursue it. It may be fruitful, it may not be fruitful. Um, so it's important to remember that. There are times that church leaders, I'm one of those, I guess, we're tempted to try to be manipulative and try to guilt people into being all in on something when in reality, you know, it's fine for us to choose a path to go in and to be up front and say, you know, this is the path we think God's calling us to as a church. Join us in this and, you know, be a part of this. That's great. It's another thing entirely to say, and if you don't join us and be all in with us on this thing, then you're not in God's will. That's totally not what the scriptures show at all. We have lots of different ways to serve. We have lots of choices in our life about money and life and family and all those kinds of things. And God can and does work through any and all the choices that we make. As long as we're loving him, trusting him and depending on him wherever we are, whatever we're doing. There's a quote I got last week that was really uh, spot on with what we're talking about here. It says, when we think of God's leading, we commonly think he's leading us to a place, but you and I are his place and he is at all times leading us from his place, which is us on purpose and for effect. We are free from the pressure of getting it just right or getting to a just right destination as well as the temptation of measuring ourselves based on how things work out. We are released to the amazing grace and joy of fruitful participation with the Spirit. That's our starting point. So this next session that we're going to go into on Wednesday night is going to unpack not so much the big questions of what's God's will for my life about how to make choices, but we're going to talk about how he actually is walking with us in the day-to-day -day normal things. And so our, our topic is going to be how do I interact with God's Spirit when I'm parenting, when I'm at work, when I'm at church, as we call it, or small group, uh, how do I interact with the Spirit then? Because in reality, most of our interactions with God and His Spirit are in those day-to-day -day mundane activities, not through, as we've been trained to think, church as a worship service or as a small group or as an event or as a university that we went to or whatever. Most of our interaction with the Spirit 
is when we're interacting with the people around us and he opens opportunities for us to interact with them and let them see his presence in our life through how we live a life of trust and dependence on him. So that's where we're going to go this next time is looking at what it means to follow God and interact with his spirit in normal life. Hope you have a great week. We'll see you this next time.